It all started with Deborah Cunningham, who is now consulting with the Aspen Institute, and who kindly introduced me, as well as brought me to the Aspen Festival of Ideas when she was working for the Atlantic Monthly. Well, Deborah put me in touch with Linda Lehrer, the communications director for the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program. Thus, truly to be thanked tonight, uh, Deborah Cunningham and Linda Lehrer. Thank you very much. Together with Judy Samuelson, the executive director of the Aspen Business and Society Program, the three are responsible for tonight. Well, not quite. I had something to do with it. And here is what I did. Well, you might want to know who I am, first of all. My name is Paul Holdengraber, and I'm the director of public programs at the New York Public Library, otherwise known as LIVE from the New York Public Library. It used to be called PEP public education programs. PEP is something I may have, but it just felt like something you don't run. It's something, maybe a stomach problem you have. And I run and direct uh, live from the New York Public Library, and as many of you know, my goal here at the library is to make the lions roar, to make a heavy institution levitate, and to create uh, what I express in two words, cognitive theater. My role, it, uh, my role, once it was clear that Walter Isaacson, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, which as you all know is a non-partisan educational and policy studies institute based in Washington, was on board, and to introduce this evening and moderate it and hopefully instigate it, that we would also have the presence of Indra Nui, the chairman or woman and CEO of PepsiCo, as well as Eric Schmidt, the chairman and CEO of Google. When I knew that they were both on board, it became clear to me that I needed to intervene and further spice things up by asking the remarkable Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable, a scholar, I love it, of randomness, risk, <laughs> and I need him, and lover of Malraux to join this group, as well as the ever so smart and provocative and handsome and learned Neil Ferguson from Harvard, the author of most recently The Ascent of Money, which carries a modest subtitle of A Financial History of the World. Now, really, we are all set to go, perfect talent group, until we hear this afternoon that a terrible act of randomness has occurred. We are down one CEO and one chair, as Eric Schmidt is sitting on a tarmac in Europe with a five-hour delay, and so he will not be able to join us. And I thought that um, he had the gift of ubiquity, or at least Google had the gift of ubiquity. He may, though, arrive in an hour or less for the tail end of the conversation, or maybe in the middle of it, depending how long Walter Isaacson keeps the juices flowing by moderating, or better yet, as I say, instigating this conversation tonight. Now, about the future of capitalism, or capitalism and the future, but maybe just a quick word about capitalism. Actually, I really would like to talk to you first about supporting the New York Public Library, which is a way of getting your capital into play. So please consider becoming a friend of the New York Public Library for a mere $40 a year, yes, you do hear me correctly, $40 a year, you can become a friend of the New York Public Library and get lots of nice treats, such as discounted tickets to all live from the New York Public Library events. I mean, $40 a year, that's a pretty cheap date if you ask me, and you get to hear this week alone Barbara Kingsolver tomorrow, and after tomorrow, Ruth Reichel with William Grimes and Dan Barber. Dan Barber. And next week, Wes Anderson with Noah Baumbach. Kathy Martin with Volker Schlöndorf. And then to cap the season, an evening about the Velvet Underground, of course, with Lou Reed and many others. To end the season, I will interview the very, very great Spanish writer, Javier Marias. So I hope you are convinced now to join, or at least join me on one of these evenings. But now, back to the future of capitalism. 
I turn it over to Walter Isaacson and his very distinguished talent pool minus Eric Schmidt. They will discuss and debate and take questions, perhaps sign books after the event, but let's start the conversation about capitalism and its future. When it comes to the future, I will leave you with this one thought. It's a thought by Paul Valéry, who used to say, the future isn't what it used to be. Thank you very much. Let's leap right into it, because uh, we had a nice long introduction. What happened? How did we get into this mess, Neil? Well, I think you have to avoid the oversimplistic answer to that question. Uh, there are a lot doing the rounds. As an historian, it's my job to tear up the first draft of history, uh, particularly if the first draft of history says, this crisis happened because of deregulation, which I think is increasingly the mainstream media answer to the question. That's much too simple. In the ascent of money, I'll give you a simple six-part answer, and you need six parts. <laughs> you do. You really do, because this is a highly complex system, and I feel sure my good friend Nassim will comment on this. First, I'll do them very quickly. First, you need banks to become untrustworthy because of excessive leverage. So we lose confidence in banks. Second, you need the bond market to be contaminated with toxic waste, things like collateralized debt obligations, triple A rated subprime mortgages. Then you need the stock market to be deuced by excessively lax monetary policy. So you need the Fed uh, to make a basic mistake between 2002 and 2004. You need the entire system of insurance to be perverted by attempts to sell insurance policies against financial disaster, AIG. You need the mortgage market to be corrupted by a political bid to make 70% of American homeowners, uh, households homeowners. And finally, you need the Chinese to finance the whole thing. <laughs> That's how it happened. It sounds like a black swan moment. <laughs> It sounds exactly, I mean, when you wrote The Black Swan, totally transformative book, we didn't expect it to all happen and come true like that. But in some ways, the unexpected randomness uh, came together as a perfect storm. For me, it was not a black swan. I mean, I, I wrote The Black Swan, people keep talking about this crisis of, you know, black swan. It's either a very white swan or a grayish swan. Mm -hmm. For the following reason, and let me tell you what is a black swan. In my book, uh, I said black swan depends on the observer. Uh, the, for the turkey being butchered the day before Thanksgiving is a black swan. It's a surprise. Is it a surprise for the butcher? No. no. So uh, if, you know, let's not be turkeys, all right? So the, uh, the problem we had is as follows. There's too much risk in the system. Visibly, uh, a bridge that's built uh, you know, by engineers who went to MIT uh, and studied economics, and the kind of stuff where you don't know a lot less coming out than you do coming in, <laughs> um, was, uh, was a lot more confidence, of course. For these people, okay, the bridge uh, was built not to sustain large trucks, and we had large trucks, so it collapsed. So the fragility of the system was apparent to anyone who understood anything about complex system, anything who understood anything about uh, non-Gaussian um, statistics, anything about the real world. But if you study the economics, then for you it's a black swan, you see? So that's, that was a, the banking system was very fragile. Uh, we live in a world that's getting more and more complex, uh, therefore less and less predictable because of non-linearities and other, some other, uh, a lot of other uh, characteristics of complex systems that we had increasing because the internet mostly. At the same time, we had an increase of uh, uh, reliance on expert forecasting. On what forecasting? Expert forecasting. Oh, experts, okay. yeah. and, and, and here you have, you saw what happened to uh, what expert forecasting, cash flow projections did to Harvard University, your employer, all right? Don't and, remind and, me. And what did they do? And now he, what? He's got Harvard, Stanford, yeah. and Oxford, so he's yeah. got his bases no, no, covered. Let me, <laughs> and let me tell you the worst thing. The worst thing is we got the, the person who created that mess in Harvard, and guess where we put him? In the White House. <laughs> Summers, all right? So we have now the U.S. Is, is a lot more fragile than it was before because we got all these people building deficits based on their forecasts. Okay. You know, some of what you've said gets back to your six points, at least five of them. 
seems to be that we mispriced risk. Is that sort of what we're doing? The, there was an elaborate theory uh, that evolved out of the efficient markets hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, that said that you could, uh, you could attach to a very high degree of accuracy, probability, to an event like a default on the bonds of a major investment bank. And you could uh, calculate this so exactly that you could sell insurance against such an event. Uh, this was the, the form of derivative known as a credit default swap. Now, in truth, and this is a point that Nassim was alluding to, all of this presupposed that the, the financial risk was like the risk that someone in this audience will suffer an automobile accident on the way home. Perish the thought, but we can attach some probability to that scenario because it's normally distributed along the bell curve. But financial crises aren't like that, and defaults by investment banks aren't like that. So you had an entire industry of financial engineers who were trying to attach probabilities to things that weren't actually risks at all. They didn't belong in the realm of calculable risk. They belonged in the realm of uncertainty. People forgot that distinction. They thought they could insure against financial crisis. In fact, the very act of trying to insure against it made the crisis worse. Now, Indra, how does business help restore confidence and get us out of it? Since, as Nassim so politely pointed out, the economists who got us into us are now running the government. <laughs> Let me, let me first say, I think this is a plot because I'm squeezed between these two great speakers, writers, mm -hmm. thinkers, and I'm just a doer. I'm mislabeled. I'm also I'm a trader. <laughs> uh, I masquerade what. as an intellectual before, you know, before, in the evening, but I'm a turn. trader. <laughs> before the crisis started, um, we were you know, $43 billion company selling great products like Quaker Oats, Tropicana, Gatorade, Pepsi, Doritos, Dew. During the crisis, we still, still sold Quaker Oats, Tropicana, <laughs> Gatorade, Quaker Oats, Doritos, Dew. And post the crisis, we're still selling those products. So from our perspective as a company on Main Street, we continue to grow, we continue to create jobs, we continue to do things the right way. We continue to make an honest living. We don't have fancy derivatives on our books. We don't have funny financial instruments. Uh, we worry about our people. We didn't cut benefits. So I look at most of capitalism, Walter, which is companies like ours. We've done a pretty damn good job. The mistakes of a few, the greed of a few, has actually tainted the good intentions and the honest workings of the many. So I look at capitalism and say, without capitalism, where is the job creation? Without capitalism, where's the innovation? Without capitalism, where's the future of democracy? So I say to everybody here, we all have to celebrate capitalism, not criticize capitalism. We have to celebrate capitalism, not regulate capitalism. So let's all start off by saying <laughs> capitalism is good. Right. And greed, to a certain extent, is good. It's excessive greed that gets us into trouble. So I'm going to quote a, a very famous movie actor and say, greed is not so bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the things that happened in the financial uh, collapse mm. is that we realized that capitalism had become s synonymous with complex finance as opposed to actually making yeah. physical mm -hmm. goods. I'm sorry, that's saying that. I mean, I, I, that's, that's, I, I don't know. People keep talking about capitalism. There's no capitalism. Mm. Explain to me what kind of capitalism we have. Think about the following situation that we witnessed. An adult makes a mistake by lending to another adult. Okay? They both made a mistake. Uh, both were incompetent. Okay? One shouldn't lend, the other shouldn't borrow. Okay? Who's paying the price? Nobody. <laughs> no. What do you mean nobody? They're paying the price. Right, but I'm not, we're, not we're, the two. We're financing losses made by bankers, all right? Is that capitalism? Capitalism has to come with incentives and punishment. Where's the punishment? Okay. Capitalism works, you know, and people share the profits and share the losses, all right? Here it's capitalism for the profits, and guess what? Socialism for the losses. So this is not capitalism that we had, no, okay? But you're allowing the financial industry and the problems and the fact right. that capitalism didn't work for the financial sector yeah. to cast a pall over the rest of industry. No, I just think that's not well, No, I'm trying to make the distinction between real businesses that 
borrow capital and produce real goods mm -hmm. versus the financial system, which I think was at the heart of this crisis. Is that That's what you're exactly saying? That's exactly right, Walter. I'm where you are. And I think if we made a mistake, we'd be soundly punished. Uh, not as much, actually, not well, hang as on a much second. As, as I understand it, automobiles are things. The automobile, <laughs> right. Uh, am, am I missing something here? <laughs> Is there a difference between a bottle of Gatorade and an SUV? Because those institutions, those companies that were in effect bankrupt were bailed out as surely as the banks. That's what we uh, bailed out. And we we bailed out. Well, hang on a sec. This, you know, I tell you something. This is purest perspective versus a practical perspective. In every country in the history of time, whenever a particular industry has gone down because of mistakes made by capitalists, whatever, if that industry was deemed important to a country, government always stepped in. Okay. Do you think government so it happened should have in the automobile in? industry, big deal. So what? It happens in every country. Look, I tell you, I think we should stop talking in the theory about the past and sit down and say, okay, what are we going to do about capitalism going forward? Or let me not even use the word capitalism. What are we going to do to bring jobs back, create enterprises that are honest, and how do we put a regulatory framework that makes everything work? We can keep talking about whether it's capitalism or crony capitalism. Where does that get us? How do we go for what is capitalism 2.0 then if you were to invent it? Well, uh, I think one of the fascinating things uh, about the world today in the wake of this crisis is that the fastest growing economy in the world and the principal engine of growth since the US uh, faltered uh, is the People's Republic of China. Mm. Now, is that a capitalist system? Well, it's capitalism with some very peculiar characteristics, not the least of which is that it's run by a communist party. <laughs> uh, its principal mode of wealth generation uh, in this crisis has been massive state-financed investment in infrastructure. Now, if we're going to talk about the future of capitalism, capitalism 2.0, the first thing that we need to stare squarely in the face is that this is a very, very long way away from what Adam Smith, the great Scottish theorist of capitalism, had in mind when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. In fact, if Adam Smith were here today, he would look at the world economy and he would be dismayed because he would see the state playing a disproportionate role in the key Asian economy. And then he would come here hoping that the new world, as he would see it, had done better. And what would he find? Too big to fail financial institutions bailed out by the taxpayer, earning monopoly profits from their position. I think Smith would be really, really skeptical about the proposition that capitalism exists either in Asia or in North well, America. Andrew, when you're talking about capitalism 2.0, mm. are you talking about a Chinese-like capitalism in which government takes even more of a role in directing? I think, Walter, we're all forgetting that all the economics textbooks were written in a world that was not interconnected, in a world where the financial system was not so complex, in a world where you know, labor was not truly mobile, it was written in a different time. And I think one of the biggest issues, and I've read a lot of what you've written, mm -hmm. Nassim, uh, I think uh, the reason that the economists didn't call this crisis the way they did, I think they were in a time war. They were stuck in the past, and that's why they didn't call the crisis the way they could have. I look at the future and say the world is so global, so interconnected, you cannot contain problems in any one country. All that we had to do is look back at long-term capital management and really take the lessons from that and move forward. So the world today is rapidly moving to one world, even though we pretend there are countries with nation states um, and boundaries. I think the, in, the web has absolutely opened the world. Financial markets are global. All our businesses are global. We cannot contain them in any one country. So the but, but, uh, but Indra, when things go wrong, that's when the nation state comes bounding back into the field. I mean, it seems so to what? me you, you, you've got a global economy when everything is going fine. But as Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, said very shrewdly, you know, banks are international in life, but national in death. And the same, as you yourself admitted, applies to any sector <laughs> of the economy that gets into trouble. But Neil, Things go wrong, and whoa, the national government is reality. there to bail you out. But that's reality. Let's live with it. It may be reality, but it can't be described yeah. as capitalism, not as we it's understand it. It's a new it. form let of me, capitalism. Why can't okay. we accept well, that? Well, can no, I no, tell let you? Me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what on, kind of a form of capitalism it is. I want to hear what your thing is, and then Nassim. As get the corner in. of capitalism <laughs> 2.0, let me explain what it's not, right? Okay. <laughs> let me tell you what, what the, the uh, Indra is perfectly right, that we are living in a world that's very interconnected, 
and a world that has characteristics that were not in a textbook. But I would, but I would also mention you've been too generous to economists by saying they're stuck in the past. Because when I wrote The Black Swan, I look at predictions, all predictions made by the economists. They've always been incompetent. Okay. <laughs> it's just that the consequences... I didn't say yeah, they're all right. No, no, but they, they have always been incompetent. It's not like the, the, it's not their, uh, you know, their failures are not new. It's just that, that uh, they were not that big. Okay. The, uh, that, I mean, that, the problem is as follows. The problem is they have, have rising complexity that you're calling globalization that people like you multinationals love, all right? And I, I, I may or may not love it, but it comes with something, all right? Interconnectedness comes with a higher risk of black swans mm -hmm. because it's like something runs more smoothly, but then you have more spikes. To give you an example, I keep, keep giving the example of run on a bank. It used to take place in the old days very slowly. Today, thanks to the web and blackberries, people have run on a bank while having dinner, you see? So you can have a planetary reaction taking place instantly because of the new system. Okay, so the world now is, has different characteristics than it did in the past. Mm -hmm. And what do you have in, in the presence of more complexity? You have more debt. Now, debt does not accept complexity. And complexity does not accommodate debt. Let me tell you why. Debt is maps one-to-one -one with overconfidence. People who are very confident about their future, like say Larry, someone like Larry Summers, Geithner, all these people, okay, they know what's going to happen in the future. They can borrow because they're certain. They know they talk to someone up there who tells them what's going to happen. But the rest of us, we don't know what's going to happen. We have more uncertainty about the future. What do you do? You issue equity, all right? So we've had a rise of complexity since the internet, particularly, since Reagan, I say, and <laughs> since the 1980, we have three times the level of debt in society in relation to GDP, okay, that we had, or had a rise, three times the level of debt we had in 1980. So what do you have? A rise in complexity and a rise in fragility. At some point, it's going to blow up. Mm -hmm. so let me tell you what the problem is. If we're talking too much about banks, it's because debt level is very high. If we start destroying debt instead of transferring it to the public, okay, the role of banks would disappear. We won't talk about banks. They can have all the crises they want. We'd laugh at them. You have to bring down, I mean, not that I want to make a compliment to people who make real products, something you can drink, all right, instead of a promissory note. You can't even, you know, you can't even smoke it. You can't do anything with it, all right? So, is, but I'm saying the, the, the role of the real products in relation to the air, okay, would increase. Because all that air, okay, all that air came from debt. Right. You see, and, and for example, someone like Goldman Sachs or someone, the late Lehman Brothers, they have an incentive in issuing debt because they make a lot more money issuing complex paper and paper. So they want their incentive is to create these uh, uh, liabilities in the economy. Let, let me explore the issue of whether the post-crisis economy could be one that doesn't depend quite as much on complex financial instruments and in debt, but got back to a system that depended more on what you would call capitalism, which is the making of products. And you mentioned earlier, well, GM failed and we bailed it out. But I would posit that the failure of GM uh, and its bailout was a political thing, but wasn't really the cause of the whole economic crisis. It was basically a banking and financial crisis. And yeah, some companies go uh, Studebaker, GM, they can go under. Is it possible we could get back to an economy more like we had 40 years ago that was not so dependent on debt, complex financial instruments, and a financial system, and was more dependent on a capitalism that just uh, thrived on equity and made uh, products? Well, it's rather hard to envisage that happening. I mean, history doesn't tend to go into reverse. And once manufacturing has been uh, outsourced or offshored uh, to much cheaper uh, countries like uh, the Asian economies, you can't bring it back by waving a magic wand. Uh, the Western economies, particularly the English-speaking economies, uh, became more and more uh, financial services led economies. And this happened over a period of 20 years for a whole range of reasons. Now, we mustn't throw babies out with bathwater here. Part of the point of the ascent of money is to say 
that, that financial services are not all bad. They are crisis prone, though, and they are prone to the kind of uh, hypertrophic growth that we saw in the last decade, and particularly in the did five they, years in leading up to the crisis. Decade, so you can't go back to a, a, a some vanished Eden where Americans make, you know, are riveters making manufactured goods. That is very unlikely no, to no, happen. Or Google, Google search engines, but or Pepsi. No, no, products. you forget so about services. Services yeah, what about are, services? Not, are not bad products. Or, by the yeah. way, but, uh, Google's, but now that he's not here. Not all financial services are bad products. And we, we just need to ask ourselves a, a practical question, following on from what's been said here. What is the appropriate level of indebtedness for a financial institution? If you look at the way the investment banks behaved in the run-up to the crisis for 10 years leading up to the crisis, on average, they were leveraged something like 25 or to 35 to 1. That is to say, they had liabilities roughly 30 times mm -hmm. their tangible equity. Now, that clearly is much too much. In the case of some of the commercial banks like City uh, Corp, it got as high as 50 or more than 50 to 1. So we have one simple lesson to learn from this crisis, and that is that excessive debt in the financial sector is very bad for the stability of the system. So we can draw some regulatory lessons from this crisis and make the system work better. But what we can't pretend is that there's some prelapsarian world in which banks don't matter. Even PepsiCo needed, I'm sure, to roll over its commercial paper. Uh, you can't pretend you could run a company like PepsiCo without a financial no, I, mean, I, I, I completely disagree. No, I mean, I disagree sort of. Uh, I, uh, Feel about free to completely one point, disagree. One yeah. point here about what you my call job easier. going back to the pre crisis world, because we're going to go back to the pre crisis world. Um, if we look at the history of debt, and we've had that conversation before, okay, and you know better than anyone in the East Coast, probably, and, okay, <laughs> what happened to the history of debt? Just the right? East Coast? Speaking. Okay, That's a very <laughs> debt jubilees. How about the world? It's in like history, <laughs> all right. In, in, in history, debt builds up, okay? We know from Babylonian days, then what do you have? A debt jubilee, okay? So we, a debt in history, the reason most Mediterranean religions do not like debt, because they learned the hard way that debt tends to build up, and guess what? Puff, disappear, yeah. except for Obama. If we didn't have these people in the White House, debt would also disappear the old-fashioned way. You know how debt disappeared the old-fashioned way? What's it called? Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy, yeah. <laughs> right? Bankruptcy is how debt disappears, or transformation of debt to equity in some way or another. All right? mm -hmm. This is how debt disappears. Now, how does debt stay in a system? What is it called? Mm -hmm. Deficit. Deficit. Because yeah. it, c two adults who made mistakes should go bust, and, and we should probably feel sorry for them and give them maybe uh, some leftover from our food, okay? <laughs> instead of, you know, they live on, fi on Fifth Avenue. Instead, what are we doing? Debt can destroy itself naturally, and it did destroy itself naturally. We're not destroying debt, okay? Yeah, and, 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 and let me tell you, no, governments, no, 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 when you we move it to Andrew governments, it stays in government, and that's yeah. a problem. Let me get Andrew yeah. back in, because I do want to hear your vision of where capitalism could go. I was enjoying looking at them adoringly, <laughs> but I won't. Mm -hmm. um, where is capitalism going? Look, Walter. Where I, should it go? Where should it go? I believe that whether it's capitalism 2.0 or 3.0, I don't care. I'm not a... 1.0. Capitalism as we know it. Honest companies making an honest living, uh, you know, uh, serving shareholders and a multitude of stakeholders. That's the capitalism I know. Um, I don't think we can create jobs and have thriving economies without a great capitalistic system. That's a system that's worked well. And I think you, you need innovation to be spurred on by capitalism. And I think in some form or the other, capitalism has to be allowed to thrive. And governments have to provide the framework for corporations to go off and do their job. Going into the future, however, I think where capitalism has to change, we cannot have this artificial divide between public and private. I think the days where companies could just do what they did, and then government was left to pick up the pieces, those days are gone. I think the future of capitalism is honest partnerships between public and private, between governments and corporations. Well, wait, explain that specifically. I don't so get let me that. go through. A regulatory framework that's sensible. That's sensible for corporations, not just sensible for governments. You know, take Indra, all Indra, does that mean, for example, that the government could say corporations should not sell junk food, including very sugar-rich drinks, 
to teenagers. <laughs> would you be in favor of that kind of regulatory framework? Look, if that made sense, I would talk about it. I would have a conversation with them about it, okay? If they just one day called me up and said, you can't sell French fries because it has 800 calories, or you can't sell a triple burger because it has 1,600 calories, I'd say that's none of your business, okay? Mm. But if they explained to me that there's a cost to society of you doing that, and by asking you to stop that, society is going to get better, and they have proof positive, I might be willing to talk to them about it. Because obviously part of the problem of healthcare in the United States is the problem of obesity. Well, I mean, just, just to, just to, let, uh, to that, draw healthcare into Neil, the Neil, debate. Neil, Believe let, me, let it drop. a responsible company understands that it has a role in society. Mm -hmm. You know, corporations are limited liability companies. We operate with a license from society. We owe society a duty of care, all right? We cannot operate in a vacuum. We cannot operate in a vacuum in a country. We cannot operate in a vacuum globally. I think the new model of the enterprise is an enterprise that recognizes that it has a role to play in society. It works with governments to make sure that it creates jobs, earns profits in a long-term, sustainable way, gets rid of the stupid quarterly earnings stuff that we go through all the time, and really worries about those sustainable metrics that keeps a company healthy for the long term. And if that means transforming the portfolio because society has changed, so be it. We will do it. Okay? It doesn't mean you just ignore the problem and but say, so you're talking care. about a much more serious role for government, as China does in its economy, as we would to do it around the world. In partnership as opposed to unilateral action. Very different. Mm -hmm. Okay? Unilaterally saying, I'm going to uh -huh. tax this mm -hmm. or I'm going to impose mm -hmm. these sorts of uh, penalties on corporations and arbitrarily raise corporate taxes, that's not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Doing it in a partnership and talking about the role of the corporation, role of the government, and how together we can improve the economy, that to me is the future of capitalism and the future of enterprise. Nassim. That's my worst nightmare. Okay. <laughs> That's because you're an economist. Two reasons. No. <laughs> one first two. one, let me tell you why. The number one, yeah. number one, we have to understand that the government it's government policies and regulations that got us here. I mean, I was a trader, incidentally. I'm also a doer. Uh, I'm also a trader now. Okay. And you learn one thing, that the government, by giving the metrics, you know, Basel II, for risk management metrics for banks, caused the crisis. Secondly, the Federal Reserve, what did Greenspan do? All right, that too big to fail, the biggest to fail, the Federal Reserve, what did he do? He tried to play with the cycle, Okay, play God with a cycle instead of say, okay, we're going to have booms and busts, let's be robust to them, okay? All right? They invited banks to take all this crazy risk-taking and, and, and uh, for, you know, betting against black swans, okay, uh, uh, because they couldn't understand the risks. That was the government. Now, the second point, so number one, regulation is not panacea, all right? And governments are not necessarily there to help us Governments are there partly to help civil servants, partly I don't know what. Okay, second point, <laughs> like now. Okay, second point, this cooperation between government and companies. Which companies are going to cooperate with government? The big companies. Are they going to help barbers, talk to barbers? No. The problem I have with government is that, particularly when they're socialist, is that they go favor the big employers. Okay, they favor the lobbyists. The favor the one who has the big bucks, not the small guy, not the barber out of the job. That's the problem with that's government. Seen, that's in God, you are dead wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, Listen. I'll get you in in a minute. <laughs> I run a company yeah. which is $43 billion in revenue, soon to be $60 billion in revenue. We will be employing 300,000 people, okay? That's direct employment. Let me tell you, we procure from many, many, many small minority women-owned companies, many small ones, companies with 10 people, 12 people. You know, if government works in partnership with us, yeah. okay, and don't get jaded by the financial industry and the fact that the government and the financial industry didn't do things oh, right. Detroit? I'm talking about, look, Detroit, we, can, well, we should talk about Detroit, Detroit too. We should talk about Detroit too. But let's Detroit focus was a on, political discussion. Yeah, let's let's talk about this, okay? If you work in partnership with companies like us and allow us to thrive and do you know, business the right way, we can create jobs. We can create direct jobs, indirect jobs, and there's a uh, multiplier effect when large companies thrive because they in turn put, create jobs for so many small enterprises. And the service industry exists to service people who have some income to pay them for the services. And, you know, a barber cannot exist because, you know, the government decided to give barbers some money. 
people who have income has to give the barber some money to cut his hair. I can provide a job to you. You can get your hair cut if you want to, and then you can pay the barber. There's I, a sort I, of a... I, I, that's, that, that's, uh, I feel very queasy about this environment where it's a top-down or governments start working Why do you in assume cahoots it's top with big down? company. Why is it what are you saying down? top down? A big company is already a top down proposition. Why? So why not uh, 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 favor Cameron in the UK, incidentally, Cameron in the UK wants to get away from that mode of the government favoring the, because in, invariably they start favoring the powerful big companies. You see? A small guy is always stifled in that story, but I'm sure Neil will, will have better answer than me because the way, I, the way he thinks... <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to throw it to Neil because he keeps leaning forward too. Go ahead. I was being very restrained. Yes, sir. <laughs> you um, take a left You're used to being a Harvard <laughs> professor. It's hard being a well, panelist. Everybody keeps saying that they're, they're a doer on this planet. I'm not a doer. I don't do. Those who don't so, <laughs> teach. So you just, you, you can disregard all that I all that I say if you regard doing as a qualification for thinking. What was that? Do you know, the last time I was involved in a public debate in New York, I got in terrible trouble uh, for saying something that was construed as conservative. So now I'm going to say something that is in fact taken from the canon of Marxism-Leninism. Uh, there was a wonderful man named Rudolf Hilferding who in 1910 published a book called Finance Capital, Finance Capital, in which he argued that the biggest uh, uh, trend to be discerned in mature capitalist economies was for the concentration of financial capital ultimately lead to lead to a fusion between the state and giant monopolistic banks. Uh, and this came to be known in Marxism-Leninism a state monopoly mm -hmm. capitalism. When I was studying uh, in Germany in the 1980s, there was still an East Germany. And in East Germany, we'd talk about Stamokap, or Stamokap for short. My fear is that what Indra makes sound so terribly alluring, a partnership between business and government, turns out in practice to be the reincarnation of Stamokap of state monopoly capitalism. We have a very cozy partnership already right now in this country between one major corporation and the government. The corporation is, of course, Goldman Sachs, and its relationship with the government increasingly makes me feel like a Marxist-Leninist. <laughs> if you look at the situation, if I may go on, look at the situation in Russia today. Who can really tell where the Russian state ends and Gazprom begins. <laughs> and these fusions that we see going on all around us in the wake of this crisis between the state and large monopolistic companies are deeply, deeply unhealthy. And they will be the undoing of us all. Let me assume that's that, not what Indra that was, was just, pushing. That was and she doesn't want Pepsi, Pepsi prom. That was such a Harvard type <laughs> comment. If it had gone to Yale, you might have said something different. But <laughs> let me just, <laughs> Judy understands what I'm saying. But let me, Neil, that is such a jaded perspective because I think both of you are completely influenced by the financial sector. I suggest you come I and visit us. I should think everybody us. in here no, is influenced wait, wait, wait. by the financial no, sector. No, that's Too wrong because I, mean, I, suggest, the whole economy is I suggest the two of you come and visit us at PepsiCo. And I'll tell you why. Because the people who work in PepsiCo are people who are mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, children. We They're weren't citizens suggesting of the community. We were not suggesting They're citizens otherwise. of the community. <laughs> when they come to work, they don't park themselves outside the door and come in. They bring their whole selves to work, okay? They want to do what's right. If you're talking about the leadership of certain companies that have led companies astray, I can, we can have a whole discussion on the CEO of the future. That's a whole different discussion. But you started off with not wanting to throw the baby out of the bathwater. That's what you've been doing for the last the half an hour. You've thrown every baby out of the bathwater. On the contrary. <laughs> yeah. Andrew, yeah. I'm going to get to that in a moment, but Andrew, let me uh, let you focus in on what you may have meant by partnership, and Neil at one point threw something out about obesity and sugary drinks. You had something called the healthy Weight commitment, co commitment so let's to talk. push healthy beverages and foods through yeah. schools and through the marketplace, allowing those of us who like regular sugar drinks and feel okay with it to have them as well. What role is the corporation supposed to do with that? What role is government supposed to do on that? So let's talk about that specifically, and let's, let me respond to what Neil said about obesity. Mm -hmm. Society used to drink a certain set of products, used to eat a certain set of snacks in the past. It's been going on for generations. Recently, we have an obesity crisis, and what we're saying is people have to 
live differently, they have to exercise more, they have to eat differently, and manufacturers have to have a role to play in this whole equation by offering products that perhaps have a different nutritional content but still taste great, perhaps have no calories for beverages, manufacturers should be offering that. And then we have to find a way to educate consumers to make the right choices of products, but also educate consumers to go out and exercise because the sedentary lifestyle is not helping the whole obesity issue. So what did we manufacturers and retailers do? We formed a consortium and said, why don't we all commit to putting out a pile of money to do several things. First, we will all commit to transform our own portfolios. And we set ourselves goals, audited by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is, you know, exactly. cannot be purer than pure. It's got a scientific advisory panel. Up there with panel. the Annie Casey Foundation. Okay, and you know, uh, the head of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is going to be the independent evaluator. Second, we committed to, uh, you know, do a test in three cities to put phys ed back in schools so that we can measure how kids can address the obesity issues through eating right and by exercising regularly. And we've reached out to the government and said, look, you've got many programs on physical fitness and obesity issues. Why don't you work in partnership with companies? Let us address this together. As opposed to 10 fragmented programs, let's put all our money together, one program, set up an independent advisory board, and let's address the issue not for Republicans, not for Democrats, not for economists, but for the American people. That's mm -hmm. what we wanted to do. And that's Great. what we're focused you. on doing, and it is going to work. Uh, Nassim, to come back to my point of complexity, uh, yes. aside from my dislike of top-down government telling people how they should eat, where the zero calories actually, in 10 years we realize that the zero calories may not be really healthy and stuff. But to come back to Mother Nature as a metric for me, uh, we just wrote a paper, I'm also a, a I write mathematical papers also, so... so you so write your... I, li I, I do uh, real work. Uh, I have my, my day job as professor of risk engineering, so I do risk engineering. Right. Model. And we're just pub publishing a paper uh, uh, now, my, my uh, colleague and I, Tapiero, in which we proved the following concept that applies to economic life that economists couldn't quite understand on observation. Uh, Mother Nature is a complex system. Why is it on land you don't have any animal bigger than an elephant? Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Visibly, Mother Nature understands it too big to fail. <laughs> this idea, yeah, and we showed mathematically why companies, when they employ 300,000 people, I'm sorry to say, they become fragile. Mm -hmm. They become, you, you don't want companies to employ 300,000 people. That, that's my point. My point is I want Mother Nature to be the model for us. And, and that, if you let things by themselves, the companies would go bankrupt when they get big, because when you get big, you become more fragile because non-linearity. We show that paper mathematically. You can apply to elephants, to why there's nothing bigger than a, than, than a whale in the ocean, and we're applying it to companies. Why companies, if you government disappear, okay, don't have this hidden you know, agenda to help big employers because they're afraid of uh, something, Companies would self-destroy very quickly. So you so would get government much more out of uh, this. I, so I'm a creative destruction guy, and right. we proved it. That's how Mother Nature works. Right. Mother Nature I think we doesn't all have would a big government popping up big elephants. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't have that. So let me push back yeah. because one of the problems with with Nassim's theory, which I am strongly attracted to, because the phrase creative destruction is hugely attractive if you have tenure, because it somehow <laughs> doesn't apply <laughs> to you. <laughs> The, the trouble is that if you allow evolution in the Darwinian sense to play out in the economic world, you end up with uh, very big crises happening maybe every 50 years. Uh, what happened in the no, Great no. Depression? No, you don't. You, no, no. Let, me, let me go no. on, Nassim, although I, I, I hate to disagree with you in public, but just for the fun of it. Um, <laughs> if you had a purely evolutionary solution to this crisis, you would have rerun the Great Depression because that was the kind of argument that was made interestingly, by Yale economists uh, in 1929 to 33, we must purge the system, we must let the bankrupt go bankrupt, we must let the too big fail. And what happened was that you ended up with not just 25% unemployment, if you do the numbers in a modern way, unemployment oh. in the US rose to 35% in 1932-33. Now, although it's easy to throw uh, brickbats at Larry Summers and his colleagues uh, in the White House, 
I think that they have done a number of extremely important things to avoid a rerun of the Great Depression. I wonder if the people in this audience realize how close we came to a rerun. Until June of this year, if you plotted industrial output, global trade, global stock markets, or the US stock market, any of those indicators from 2007 and compared it with 1929 to 31 was the same. It was identical to the extent that I felt until June we are probably going to have a second Great Depression, despite policy. Now, we got out of that by avoiding mass bankruptcies. I think the problem with Nassim's model is that though it's theoretically elegant, it condemns us to really a Great Depression every 50 That's years or so. Uh, that, that makes no sense. Yeah. Mother Nature doesn't let animals. Let me explain to you what the banking no, system... But Mother Nature what, no, no, leads on. to extinction. Mother Nature would not... Want? No, Mother Nature would not have saved Citibank in 1983. The reason we have this problem is because we saved Citibank in 83. We allowed them to be as incompetent as they wanted by saving them again in 91. We yeah. saved Detroit. We saved Chrysler. Yeah. We saved companies. We've been saving big companies, helping big companies. The pro Mother Nature doesn't start you know, feeding elephants to get bigger and bigger. All right, bigger. But in the Great Depression, yeah, right. we allowed 15,000 yeah, banks to fail, and we ended up with one third of the workforce unemployed. Is well, that really this is better? Not, we're not, we're not, we can't compare. You're a historian. You're saying yeah. we can't compare. These events are completely different. Okay. Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to move to the audience in a yeah. second. We're not going to solve the Great Depression, but I want to have Indra sort of say a lesson, which is how long has Pepsi Corporation been in business as a large, co as a corporation? Pepsi, the beverage business, yeah. has been in business for over 100 years. Right. But the co combination of no, Pepsi No, but I meant 100 years. Is, and do you see it here 100 years from now? Absolutely. So what makes a company built to last like that? Uh, first of all, I think 300,000 uh, people is, in my books, a uh, little dog, not an elephant. It's just <laughs> your okay. frame of reference. But I think it's how a company views its role, the ethics of the company, the values of the company. If all of that is right, I think the company is built to last. Uh, let me, uh, I, this has been such a lively panel, I've barely gotten questions in, so we should let the audience attempt it. Uh, raise your hand, and I'll just... Okay, I see a hand right there. Go ahead, shout it out, and I'll repeat it. Yes, stand up. Yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, there is a microphone. Now, I'll just point to people, and we can chat. Now, just stand there, because I don't want speeches, frankly. So, yeah. Okay. I can... As no fair reading promise. a speech. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, to Neil, Neil Ferguson, doing is a qualification for thinking. Secondly, I'd like to ask okay. this question. If uh, someone used the word sustainable, and I want to ask whether capitalism in its, large, um, per, in its large diameter doesn't expect to have growth in profit all the time, and whether that isn't in contradiction to the idea of sustainability. Neil, thank you. I'm always reminded of Churchill's comments about democracy in discussions like this. Free market capitalism is the worst of all possible economic systems, apart from all the others that we've tried from time to time. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's obviously the case that, and we've seen this uh, really from the very beginnings of industrial capitalism, that there will be negative externalities, that environmental degradation will, will occur. Uh, and that is precisely when the state does have a role to play in limiting those externalities. Uh, so I don't think we really have an alternative model that's preferable. I've argued against state monopoly capitalism tonight because I believe in a dynamic free market of relatively small uh, and competitive firms. But I think in order to make sure that those firms don't unwittingly cause profound environmental damage, there needs to be a role for government and, in, and for international agreements. A case in point is the way in which coal is being burned in Asia right now. We're living through the biggest industrial revolution of them all. It's vastly larger mm -hmm. than what happened in the United States, much less in Western Europe. It's the Chinese industrial revolution, and to a terrifying extent, it's coal fueled. Now, if nothing is done to restrain the Chinese from burning cheap fossil fuels, it is highly likely that there will be some serious environmental fallout.
So in order to have sustainable capitalism, there clearly is a role uh, for the state. And that's the role that I would envisage. Not a role of constantly bailing out excessively large institutions, but a role of setting a framework within which negative externalities are limited. Well, let's talk about externalities. It can be anything from carbon to obesity to foreign oil causing wars or whatever it may be. How should capitalism price those externalities that the marketplace doesn't capture, such as pollution or whatever? I don't know. I, I can't speak about capitalism in general. Walter, I can tell you from our perspective, we articulated a goal for our company which said, we as a company want to deliver performance with purpose. And the performance is, commercially, we want to be known as a great company. But we said we had to do our job ethically too, which meant that in anything we do, we didn't want to uh, create cost to society. So uh, we wanted to transform the portfolio because society has changed. And to keep with so the changes in societies, we've committed to make massive changes in our portfolio. And just to give you an idea, in the United States alone, where servings of beverages has grown about 5%, the calories per serving has come down 7%. So net, there's a massive reduction in the calories that we're putting out in beverages. So we've committed to transform the beverages massively. We've committed on the environmental plank to have net zero plants, to make sure that we reduce water usage massively across the world, go to washing of our bottles that are not done with water but done through e-beam. I mean, we are, we are deploying tech, green technologies so that we don't add cost to any of the community or societies in which we operate in. And we want to be viewed as one of the greatest employers in the world of capitalism. So I look at us and say, if all companies, and I'm again, look, I'm not here to make a commercial on PepsiCo, but that's the company I know best. Mm -hmm. um, I just look at our company and say, if all companies practiced performance with purpose and wanted to be viewed as a responsible corporation, why isn't capitalism great? And how, how can we get more companies to behave But that do way? you do that because it gives your shareholders a better return on investment, or do you do it because it's a correct moral thing to do, and you would do it even if it reduced your return on investment? Look, I, I think the definition of shareholders is an ancient definition. The new definition is the multiple stakeholders. Because, you know, there's been a definition which said, just earn the biggest bang for the buck, and don't worry about the debris you leave behind. That's what's got us into this mess. I and I think if you start taking a holistic view and saying, you can't make profits at the expense of multiple communities because it's all going to come back to haunt you. If society gets worse, if the environment is terrible, your taxes are going to go up because somebody's got to clean up that mess. And then it's going to come back to you in terms of higher healthcare costs or higher corporate tax or individual tax rates. So I think all companies who have major roles to play in society should practice performance with purpose. And I don't use that as our cliche, but it's much more a set of words that every uh, company should be held accountable for. Yeah. Those are noble words, Indra. I, I would find them more plausible if you hadn't earlier quoted the famous Gordon Gecko line, <laughs> greed is good. <laughs> and I just wanted to counteract that by saying, if what you say is what you really believe, you shouldn't ever say that greed is good. Good is good. Virtue is good. And this is why you shouldn't just read Smith's Wealth of Nations, you should read his theory of moral That's sentiments. Right. Yeah. Capitalists in the 18th century worldview were not merely profit-maximizing robots. They were also people with a sense of empathy with other human beings. I think that's what you've just said, but it's certainly not consonant with greed is good. That's not no, really what you I believe. Let me tell you something. Let, let me stop you right there, because as I look at capitalism in general, okay, what do we all do? We are trying to create a surplus, all right? And that surplus gets moderated because of competition, and competition exists or, you know, that surplus is uh, moderated away because it's not obfuscated, okay? I think in the whole financial world, the crisis, nobody understood what these instruments were. Everybody thought these instruments were exotic and were creating value, while in reality, nobody understood what it was doing to the economy. So that was capitalism based on obfuscation. Mm -hmm. In most of our industries, capitalism is moderated. I said excessive greed is bad, but the surplus that results because of normal greed, which is good for capitalism, is moderated by competition. Okay? Uh, uh, and that's uh, what's uh, good about our industries. I, I want to ask you a question. I, there, sure. there, I have a little problem uh, with one, one point. Uh, when, I, when I looked at the data uh, mm. in, 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 
in my spare time, sometimes I play with data uh, when I have insomnia and jet lag. So we looked at the following, that small companies, when they're very small, they seem to have the risks, the jump to the upside. They seem to be more like, uh, my, my, you know, the benefit from uncertainty. Uh, the minute they become listed and they become sort of socialized by the system, uh, guess who's going to control the company? You don't control the company? Some MBA who doesn't know anything, working for Goldman Sachs, <laughs> who calls you up and bullies you. All right? And that's the problem that we have. We've been through all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. I've said, yeah, that's the, but the problem. But you came up so through not the finance division, but the marketing. I, I was the CFO of the yeah. company. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but you did marketing so too, didn't you, or something? No, no. I was strategy and finance. But strategy. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. These, all these bankers called on me and tried to sell me the no, no, most no, no, exotic no, no, that's instruments. That's not what I meant. That's what I meant. By analyzing you, making buy or sell recommendation, mm. they run the company. The stock market is a game for morons, as we all know. So. And I agree the quarterly earnings is for morons, okay? Uh, do you, you does that pay. affect when you try to do quarterly earnings announcements? Uh, we do that today because that's what the law requires. Yeah, but I, I think we should, Walter, if you don't mind, let's so shift the discussion. We are in a mess, all okay. right? We have a crisis. There's no question about it. What are we going to do going forward? Let's talk about solutions because we've talked about the past enough. And Hold on one second. Uh, Let me Rick, yeah. Hey, pal. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna let the conversation keep going, if you don't mind, but finish up, and then I'm gonna turn to Eric next, if you don't mind, Nassim. Thank you. So uh, my suggestion is we should move the discussion now to, so what should we do going forward? So what should we do going forward, <laughs> given the financial <laughs> crisis? I mean, what, what you, know, you know this. I'm, I'm more interested in working on the airline industry <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when you're stuck on a commercial flight. Was that United? I'm not gonna okay. say the name. <laughs> Uh, my own. Uh, uh, my concern about, and again, I, 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 it's great to be here. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, my concern is we are generating an infinite amount of debt. Mm -hmm. We seem to be sort of, you know, the initial intervention has done whatever it was going to do with all of its imperfections. And I want to know what's going to happen. Are you talking about uh, government debt, corporate it's, debt, it's, personal well, debt? Well, most corporate debt is going down remember, right. because corporations are hoarding cash. But the fact of the matter is that, 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 that if you look at the math, I just don't understand what the new model is. Is it a capitalistic model? Is it a different model? In terms by, of by the way, I'd like to be in one of those too big to fail companies. The ones yeah. where you know, they just kind of get, they bail you out whenever you screw up. Yeah, you will be. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it's because the government is taking on far too much debt out, coming out of this crisis? I think it's because it's the difference between politics and business. Right. And the logic of politics, uh, every president ultimately has this logic around, well, I'll pass this bill because it roughly has these economics, but then in fact those are not the economics that, that comes. I mean, we're, we're, the process, the logic of entitlement programs, the logic of the way the government works, and the more I'm involved in business, the more I th sit there and think, well, couldn't we like run the government a little bit more rationally? But you know, you were a big supporter of Obama. You and were there and, and still and are. And remain safe. Very much so at the beginning, you're on that council of uh, John Doors and yourself or whatever. And yet, partly because of the way government is, you and everybody else on that council couldn't really go into government. And if I may guess, of the top presidential appointments, the number of people who've actually run a business is approximately zero, right? Is that part of the problem? Well, first, because I'm not sure I agree with the line of, uh, the line of questioning because the, the implication. The, the Obama administration is full of incredibly smart people. Right? The problem that may is, be the problem. The, well, you know, smart people can be a problem, I guess. But the fact of the matter is that in terms of experience and, and insight and strategic reasoning, it's among the best we've ever had. And, and I say that as a strong supporter. The problem is, again, I'm just trying to understand what is the strategy here. Right? It seems as though we're, if you look at the base case, we've now established the following principle. We're going to have deficits beyond the eye, the, uh, eye can see, large increases in government spending, and this is true in many countries, not just in the United States, and then relatively low growth, and by the way, we have a weak dollar strategy, we just don't call it that. Um, so how do we fix that? Well, my answer is private sector investment, private sector growth, which is always, in my view, how you grow out of these things. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'll re defer to the mathematicians and academics who understand this much better than I, 
can the current hole we've dug ourselves into be gotten out of with any reasonable growth rate from the sum of all of the economics? And that's an interesting economic debate. But the problem before us will be solved not by what government does, but rather by what private actors and innovation does. And I would tell you that America, speaking as a proud American, uh, has a huge future ahead of ourselves in essentially high-tech manufacturing jobs, uh, scientific investment, all the, kind of, all the global things that we normally do. And I could go on and on about that if you're interested. But the fact of the matter is that's our future, and we should be honest about it. Mm -hmm. But in fact, government has gone into a kind of weird private equity mode. We're witnessing the biggest leveraged buyout of all time, uh, in which the federal government uses leverage to buy a whole bunch of failing companies. Uh, I don't know if the president realizes he's running a private equity partnership, but he is on a massive scale, just as Ben Bernanke is running the biggest hedge fund. Uh, in human history. <laughs> and I share your concerns, Eric. Welcome, by the way, congratulations on making it onto the platform. I like a man who fulfills his obligations <laughs> right. despite the airlines. Thank you. Let's thank Eric for, uh, if I were him, I would have gone right to the hotel and ordered a drink. <laughs> thank you, Eric. But you raised a question, Eric, which is the one that troubles me the most. How far do the unintended consequences of massive deficit spending, how far do those consequences impede the process you described? I totally agree. The only way out of this is technological innovation, which the US traditionally excels at, and entrepreneurial application of new ideas. But what if we've embarked on a course uh, of fiscal extravagance that ultimately makes that less easy than it used to be? What if it turns out that we're no longer the best place to innovate uh, because of a mounting debt burden that ultimately leads to heavier taxation and diminished incentives for entrepreneurs? I think you're a little, a little too negative on that. I mean, the American educational system is, is just phenomenal, especially at the college and graduate school level. The production the rate of sort of, yes. hold on, that, the, we, well, I want to get into college, And right. by the way, and if we would just let all those people come to our country and keep them here, mm -hmm. rather than kicking them out after we educate them, that would be helpful. Um, America is a tremendous draw for the kind of people who want to create the kind of future that, that I think a lot of people talk about and I think is possible. The fact of the matter is we're not going to have a lot of high volume, low wage jobs. They're going to be other ways. Welcome to the globalization. But what we will have is we'll have um, completely new, inv new industries built and invited in, in invest here, the most obvious involving the ones in energy. And I don't, I'm not just talking about green energy, I'm talking about rebuilding energy in general, right? And that's something which America can exceed at. So I think there is a path there. And then everybody else will say, oh, look, well, I had that idea too. We should focus our effort on the people who will grow things rather than the people who will just consume existing pieces of the pie. I'm interested in making the pie bigger. Did you, uh, oh, well, let me, one of the discussions we had here was whether the American capitalist system in the past 20 years became too dominated by the world of finance and creating complex instruments and everybody taking Neil's course at Harvard who was a smart mathematician instead of going to any company except Google, which is the only one that could compete, would rather have gone to Wall Street and created uh, a hedge fund instrument. Do you think that there's a way to get, or should we try to get, more productive people into the part of the economy that's not just financial instruments, whether it be Google or Pepsi? Why would that question be any different 50 years ago than today? Because the financial sector was much smaller as a percentage of GDP 50 years ago. But so was my industry. It didn't exist. <laughs> no, no, there's, no, no. There is a difference here. 50 years ago, you did not have the complexity we have today. You did not have the interdependence. You had a much more predictable environment. And 50 years ago, you didn't have Google, precisely because you didn't have Google, right? You didn't have massive, uh, you know, uh, jumps in economic variables, and you didn't have over-efficiency that comes from globalization. And over-efficiency makes things run smoother, very cheap, except when you got a problem, boy, you got a problem, okay? So. 50 years ago, we had a different world. You can't, I mean, I'm sorry you're a historian, Neil, but, uh, but sometimes you, it's good that I'm sometimes you forget. Sorry. But I mean, no, it's good to be a historian if you go very, 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 very far. And, but, or if you're as good as you, or the best in the world. The, 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 Thank the, you. Yeah, but, but, but you're the best mathematician. Really, no, and but, no, but you the can't best risk go, engineer. But you can't go, but you can't go take data points, say, oh, that's how it was as a depression, that's how it was 50 years ago. The world is so different, mostly because of you guys. <laughs> let, let me raise, pick up on a but, point. Uh, Go, know, ahead, I, I, Go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. I'm still not sure. 
it's always been the case that the best and the brightest have been attracted to high quality finance jobs. And I think they, it wasn't, it was also true in the, in the 50s and the 60s and so forth. Uh, uh, not that much. When I, I mean, I, uh, before my generation, I went to business school, before my generation, nobody went to finance, they went to consulting. The smart people. Well, that's the well, same. Well, From my perspective, it's the same. Yeah. 50 years ago. All right, but is this uh, the point? Is something we should try point, to no, change? Here's why. Here's why it's the same. Because there's a category of people who spend their time worrying about the allocation of money, structure of business, and so forth, so on. And then there's a set of people who are running running companies, inventing new things, doing research, what have you. Um, I'm not so worried about the siphoning off. Uh, you had a situation where you had artificial incentives that caused people to want to come on the margin here. But in fairness to those people. Had they come to Silicon Valley in 1999, they would have received a far greater payoff during our little bubble. So who are we to criticize the Wall Street folks for having their bubble? It was just a bigger bubble. Do you think, though, that Google creates something that's more real than somebody on Wall Street creating a financial instrument? Um, to be honest, not really. Okay. I mean, Google, uh, when I walked into the company, I said, you, people pay you for this thing? <laughs> These little ads? Yeah. I mean, again, uh, you know, I'm from the you know, big iron school of manufacturing. So uh, in the knowledge economy, you do have very important sectors. Uh, it may very well be that the markets misallocated capital to themselves fundamentally because of the agency problem of ownership. Um, a simple diagnostic, diagnostic of what we went through is the incentives drove the behavior. And it's easy to understand this if you think about the people who, who own companies, right, and who had a lot to lose behave differently than the people who own just a little bit of the company in the form of stock options. Um, and so you had different assumptions of risk and so forth. The system would have corrected had it had a greater ownership culture and less of an agency culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and again, one of the comments is it's easy to criticize Wall Street on that, but in fact, the system won't, a single actor who is a prince can't revise their compensation because their competitors have to act in unison and it's illegal for everybody to plot together, that's called antitrust. So at some point if we want to address the compensation issue, which in my view is at the root of a lot of these issues, um, you'd have to do it through some form of government action or consensus. Let me switch to something else we were talking about earlier, which is the role of the corporation in doing more than just maximizing its shareholder value. but trying to be a corporation with a purpose. Google is very much that way. Its initial public offering warned investors it was going to be that way. Uh, do you see that as an essential part of what Google is and what American corporations should be? Well, I, I hope so. There's nothing in Google that's unique to Google in terms of the notion of purpose. Uh, people want to work for a reason and working as a, just as a salary person or just for a boss who's sort of rough on them doesn't work very well. They want to work for a spirit or a goal. Um, it's much easier to manage people when they have an overarching principle. It's, it's many institutions, not just Google, have this. Universities, for example, have them, uh, which I highlighted before. So I would hope that Google establishes a model for sort of the modern sort of way a corporation should work. And while it's absolutely true that under the theory of the fir firm, the the goal of the CEO and the goal of the board is to maximize shareholder returns in the form of, of profit sharing, if you will. That's not really how corporations should be run. CEOs, speaking as one, have many constituencies, local communities, governments, politicians, so forth and so on. And you'd be foolish to just try to maximize short-term returns. Uh, it, and we argue that we get better long-term returns by doing all the other things because we get the better people, we get a better brand, uh, we're more innovative, all, all those sorts of things. Uh, but the other reason that, we, that we, we've just taken a position that corporations should be more than simply a shareholder vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something you said earlier, which is we're entering a knowledge-based economy and America will thrive because we have the best education system. And of course, Neil leaned forward and mentioned the fact that our K through 12 education system used to be the best in the world, used to graduate the most, used to have the highest scores. It is somewhere between 17th and 20th, depending on the metrics you now use. And worse yet, it's a two-tiered education system where our kids probably do just fine getting an education, but the gap between 
those born in good zip codes and those born in bad is widening. Is that the major investment we should be making in order to have an economy in the 21st century that succeeds the way our capitalist model did in the 20th? And I'm going to ask, I know Indra and I were talking about it earlier, so I'm going to get some on the panel to talk about it too. It's, it's, this again is not a new subject. There was a big crisis, if you remember, in the mid-80s mid about this question about um, secondary school education. And the criticism I would offer is I haven't heard very many new ideas in 25 years. Is that because there's a monopoly generally in public education? Well, there, it depends on your sort of political view. Do you, you know, if you like this structure or that structure. Let me just observe that in most of the other worlds I live in, there have been tremendous innovation, or at least ideas that sound credible. Um, there are a couple in education, obviously charter schools and those sorts of things have come up, but those are actually relatively old ideas. Uh, and I would offer that with the information revolution, um, Google being an example of it, you would think that education would have changed radically, right? Every one of you now has access through your mobile device, and I would guess that everyone here has a mobile device on you. You have access to essentially the entire knowledge of the world with enough keystrokes. So why is that not radically changing education, you know, at every level, at, a, at an age appropriate and appropriate way for people to learn? And I see relatively little evidence of that. So that tells you something about edu the education system, that it's, that it's based on heuristics as opposed to measurements, or maybe it's a monopoly, or maybe it's underled, or maybe there's not enough competition, or maybe there's not enough investment. I mean, these are all plausible. But I observe that we're not making fundamental, pro pro we're not gonna fundamentally address this until you've got an, a new idea that really scales. And I haven't heard it yet. Go ahead. I have a comment on education that, that, that uh I've been discussing with Neil, or we'll discuss it in the next conversation, which is that most people have the illusion that uh, technology comes from science and that education, you know, is, is determined. In fact, education is something, you know, that comes from development and not determines development, and science comes from technology, not the reverse. So, and in the black swan, uh, let's talk about this puzzle. You have all these snotty Europeans who say, oh, the Americans, they're bad in math, not very educated, don't know uh, paintings, don't have culture, don't know history, all right? And they'll be writing these words, they'll be wearing Levi 501 using a Mac, <laughs> writing these words using Microsoft Word, okay? So and you realize where does the Google innovation Docs. comes, and and of course uh, googling things on, um, on on the system while sipping Coca Cola, right? Mm. So uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sipping uh, Pepsi Cola. Sorry, <laughs> that, 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 okay. So the uh, He's academics. <laughs> Pepsi Cola. So here here you you see so where uh, uh, so it looks like uh, 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 the advantage we have in America is probably bad education that makes us think out of the box. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So that's, that's, people keep insisting on education. The things are just fine. Ideas come from here. What do you want to transform us into something like France? Mm -hmm. yeah. Andrew, well, I mean, what do you mm -hmm. want to do with education? What's right? the question, Walter? About what you think needs to be done for K through 12 education if we're going to succeed as a, in a future capitalism. You know, it goes back to something Eric said. Um, new industries have to be spawned, mm -hmm. and um, we're having a conversation at the Clinton Global Initiative talking about. Uh, new industries and creating jobs for all the people who are unemployed. We were talking about a massive retraining program. And somebody asked the question, retraining for what? Okay, mm -hmm. because whatever the new industry is, it's probably an industry that requires different educational skills than perhaps those people who have been displaced. So it raises a question on what are these new industries? Any which way you look at it, it's likely that the well-paying jobs in the new industries requires some background in science and math. At least that's my hypothesis. And based on everything I've seen, science and math are the only two subjects where you've got to study it from K all the way through 12 through college, unlike history or economics, which you can pick up in college and go from there. I think math and science, you have to have that foundation and learn it all the way through. I have children, and I've watched the K to 12 education here in the United States. It's very good. But in math and science, I don't think it serves the kids as well as it needs to for the new world. And let's talk about what's not working well. The books are fine. The schools are fine. There's all kinds of online tutoring uh, methods available. That's not the issue. What the kids lack is the human touch to provide them the tutoring services once they come home. The mathematics levels are going up. 
science, the way it's being taught in schools, kids are being accelerated because the world around them is changing so fast. They come home, the parent or the caregiver cannot give them the right tutoring at home mm. to help them address issues they have. And my feeling is we have to create some sort of a after school group tutoring mechanisms using all the retirees who are all the big baby boomer generation who have now retired, perhaps bring them all back and through some sort of a service score, a stipend that's given to them because they're all in financial difficulty with the meltdown of the market, put them to work by opening the schools and saying, tutor the kids. Okay, mm -hmm. find a way to give back in the evenings from 5 to 10 so the kids can actually get solid science and math tutoring after school so they can learn those fundamentals exceedingly well. Because when they don't learn the fundamentals in science and math well, they cannot progress afterwards. We actually have solved this problem in Britain. It's called boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the key question here is whether you can deliver quality secondary education with a state monopoly system. And it's pretty clear that you can't. Uh, you can create a baseline of education at the primary level uh, through massive public provision. But the reality is that e educational excellence throughout history has nearly always come from independent, privately funded institutions. The best secondary schools in the world are the private uh, schools in England, the Eton's and Winchester's, no question, there's nothing as good here. Uh, and the best universities in the world are the privately funded universities like Harvard and Stanford. This is not coincidental. It comes back to capitalism. The reality is that private corporate entities in competition will produce better results, more innovation than state monopolies. That's really been the theme of my sermon tonight. Do not let, let new state monopolies form, whether it's in the financial sector or in the automobile sector. And where you've got them, most obviously in education, uh, you must try and break them up. It will only happen. This educational revolution Eric was talking about is coming. I'm sure of that. It's just taking a while for the information revolution to transform the materials that we use in teaching. But when I am a doer, I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. which is a kind of doing, funnily enough, turns out to matter. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and th and that's, that's, that's what interests me most. How can we get rid... I mean, you said the books are good. Indra, the books are incredibly boring. Some of the most boring books I have ever seen in my life are the history textbooks that they inflict on high school perception. students. I find the books incredibly fascinating. Which ones? <laughs> every, every science and math book I've opened. Yeah, but you right. think Pepsi is a nice drink. <laughs> <laughs> and so do I. I love Pepsi. No, I'm going to ask the Anyone? panel. To I even think your book is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask the panel to wrap up with <laughs> one say. sort of broad question which is, how time. do you think <laughs> capitalism, I'll use that as a phrase, or our business and finance system should evolve in the next five to ten years? I think, I mean, my, my enemy in this world, this actually comes from education typically because uh, of this, uh, typically the more math you know, the more likely you are to blow up the bank. That's a rule that we had that has been verified by recent events. Anyway, so my problem is expert, prob uh, expert error that the society is getting more complex while relying more and more on expert problems, expert error. We need instead to focus on robustification of society, robustification of the system, a system to be more robust like Mother Nature. Okay, it's very robust. Uh, it looks like the last uh, uh, 13 months we've been going away from robustness. Nobody seems to understand the point. Certainly not in Washington. The only human being whom I think understands the point is David Cameron in the UK your compatriot, right? mm -hmm. other than him, it's hopeless. So I'm very depressed. Andrew. <laughs> Question is? How would you see uh, business and capitalism evolving coming out of this financial crisis in the next five or 10 years? What would you recommend if you were on Eric's panel in front of the president? Look, I think this is a historic moment in contemporary history where um, we have, we're in the midst of a real crisis. Um, Normal solutions to this problem are unpalatable. For example, if we say that the US has to become more of a savings economy and China has to become more of a consumption economy, are we willing to let the US economy shrink? Is that palatable? I don't know. But all of the solutions that exist on the table are all difficult, difficult solutions to sell to the public, especially by a politician. 
But I think this is also a time that we have to find a way for political, po politicians of both parties to come together with business. I know you guys don't like it, but we have a role to play. It would be great if Democrats, Republicans, and the business community could come together and talk about what should be the nature of business going forward. How do we bring jobs back to the country? How do we retrain people for what industries? And how are we going to bring the backbone of manufacturing back to the United States? I'd love for us to consider some sort of a uh, group that goes off and does this for the sake of the country, because we are spending far too much time talking about how we got into this mess. The fact is, we are in the mess. How about if we put all the energy to talking about what are the solutions to get out of the mess? Because how we got into the mess is good for discussion and panels and for all academics and maybe even some of the doers. But all those people who are unemployed are waiting for us to talk about how we're going to get out of the mess. Which is why I asked this last question, which is what should we be doing going forward, Neil? I think almost the opposite of what Indra just said. Mm -hmm. I, let's, I agree. Let's try and keep Republicans and Democrats away from business. <laughs> let's stop them meeting businessmen and their lobbyists. Let's, let's yeah. build a wall between the world of politics and the world of business. You asked, you know, Walter, you asked a question about evolution. And I believe in evolution. You know, we are, after all, celebrating Darwin's uh, bicentenary. Uh, we're celebrating uh, the year the Origin of Species was published. Here I'm going to come back and agree with Nassim. What we need is evolution. We need to bring the evolutionary forces back into play in our economy so that capitalism can be based on competition and on natural selection. And yes, on the survival uh, of the fittest, not the fattest. So I think the future of capitalism has to be a fundamental shift back to competition and away from state monopoly capitalism. I don't think we'll get it, but that's what I'd like to see. I am so glad I'm on the other side <laughs> of you, Walter. <laughs> I'm protecting you, Eric, Thank as usual. You. Uh, I'm actually an optimist on this, and uh, I, I would observe that the, we faced the largest financial crisis since World War II, maybe the Depression, uh, and we got through it in many cases very, very quickly and did so in a, in a pretty impressive way. Um, for people who are still unemployed, that's not a very good message because they don't see it yet, but it's clearly coming. The, results that happened in September, uh, financial results from many companies indicated uh, sort of the ending of the recession, and indeed the government is beginning to say that. So I think there's reasons to believe that the underlying economic structures are, are kicking in, and they're kicking in in a really good way. So as an optimist, my view is that we will sort this out, that people will get back to, to how... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. To, to, to how you really create wealth in a society. And it's really created by small business, large business, new business, innovation. I would also tell you that although we complain an awful lot uh, in, in the United States, you'd much rather have our problems than, for example, Britain's problems economically right now, if you look at debt to equity and so forth. So from our perspective, I think we're pretty well positioned. We have a historic culture of innovation. We move quickly. We, 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 uh, we focus ourselves as a as a country pretty well. And my guess is that the government will continue in its current behavior as it did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and 40 years ago, and that our opportunity as citizens is to sort of do the best we can, knowing that this is how our political system works, and it's not gonna change that much, to go and actually make the world a better place. And I think that's, that's what all of us should try to, to set out as the opportunities come to us over the next few years. Well, thank you. I want to uh, thank uh, the New York Public Library. Paul Golden holding jobber. Um, if you're, this is part of a Aspen in New York event, uh, which if you're a ticket holder or you want to be part of it, see Judy Samuelson there. But it uh, uh, continues tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. at Bloomberg uh, headquarters at 70, 731 Lex. Uh, I know we didn't get, because it was uh, kind of juggling up here, as much audience participation, but we'll hang around. I think Nassim's book, The Black Swan, is there. I'm sure at least 17 of your books are there, and the rest of us will hang around and talk. I want to thank the panel for making my job so easy. I just listened. Thank you.